we need to find out what even is a Jewish language. And so I'm going to share my screen so that you can see my slides here. Throughout history, Jews have usually spoken a variety of the local non-Jewish language. And this demonstrates that Jews are both a part of and apart from their surrounding society. This is not just a linguistic concept. This is a sociological, historical concept. And we also find um, dis diversity in Jewish languages. So today we're going to talk about Jewish language varieties, their distinctive stat features, and then next time we're going to talk about their contemporary status. So first, how did Jews get to various places? Well, the Israelites then became the Jew, the Jews, um, and that they began in the land of Israel, this little purple area here, and at various points in history made their way to other places. And in each of those places, they picked up the local language and Judaified it. And so you get languages like Judeo-Persian and Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Georgian and Judeo-French. And the two most commonly known about Jewish languages are Yiddish and Ladino. They are actually exceptions in this history because they were maintained for centuries away from the places where they originated. Um, Ladino originated here in Spain, Judeo-Spanish, and was maintained outside of its original land in North Africa and the Ottoman Empire, these pink areas here. And you'll hear more about that from Brian Kirshen, who I think is here today joining us, and he'll be giving the lecture next time. Yiddish, which you won't be hearing about because it's not an endangered language, is um, also an exception to this history because it started in Germanic lands and was maintained in Slavic lands after Jews moved eastward. And so these are a little bit different from the other Jewish languages because they continued to develop in a land where they did not have much contact with the uh, non-Jewish correlates of their languages. So another concept in Jewish linguistic studies is a continuum of Jewish linguistic distinctiveness. This is the idea that any language or any utterance can be situated along a continuum of distinctness in relation to its non-Jewish correlate. So for a post-co-territorial language like Yiddish and Ladino, that would be the language that it originated around. So for Yiddish, it would be a Germanic language and for Ladino, it would be Spanish. Um, and, and these are all simplifications, obviously, because there's a lot of different varieties of these languages that go into the creation of those languages. But for most Jewish languages, the non-Jewish correlate would be the language spoken by the non-Jews in the area that they are currently in. Like for Judeo-Arabic, the non-Jewish correlate would be Arabic of their local land, because Arabic is different in different places. So in Morocco, it would be Moroccan Judeo-Arabic, and in Iraq, it would be Iraqi, I'm sorry, Iraqi Arabic, right? So um, we can situate various languages along this continuum, and uh, at the least distinct end of the continuum, we have Jewish Amharic, which um, scholars often talk about as not distinct at all, from Amharic, maybe there are a few words that are different, maybe they avoid some particularly Christian words and use some different words in the, in the Jewish community, but they did not have uh, access to Hebrew texts in Ethiopia and did not incorporate words from Hebrew into their languages like other languages did. Um, also Judeo-French and Judeo-Persian from the Middle Ages, the written documentation that we have is pretty similar to the written documentation that we have of medieval French and Persian, except that it's written in Hebrew letters. And then all along the middle of this continuum are many other Jewish languages like Judeo-Greek or Jewish Malayalam spoken in Southern India, Judeo-Italian, 
uh, and Jewish Neo-Aramaic and various varieties of Judeo-Arabic, some of which are more or less distinct than their surrounding Arabics. So what makes these languages distinct? Well, the Hebrew and Aramaic component is the most salient uh, aspect of distinctiveness. So as you probably know, Jews around the world have used Hebrew and Aramaic texts for prayer, for study, and for various other sacred, mostly sacred purposes, uh, also sometimes for business non-sacred purposes. And sometimes there is a tradition, in, in many communities, there's been a tradition of word-for-word -word translation, that is translating the Hebrew texts into the spoken language but following the word order of the text. And I'm going to give you examples of all of these. I'm just giving you an overview right now. Um, and then we have loan words. That is, a loan word is a word from one language that's used within another language. And so loan words from Hebrew and Aramaic might refer to religious concepts, secret language, euphemism, and just other words that have become part of the spoken language. And many of the Jewish languages that have been written, not all have, some are just oral, were written in Hebrew letters. And there are also exceptions to this. For example, Judeo-Georgian and Jewish Malayalam were not written in Hebrew letters until uh, the speakers moved to Israel. So another source of distinction in Jewish languages is influences from a previous Jewish language. Um, and I'll give examples of all these later. We also have archaic features or archaisms, features that the Jews still use, even though their non-Jewish neighbors stopped using them. Migrated regionalisms, that is features from one region within the language territory that migrated to a different region. So it might sound like they're from a different place, because they're using a feature from that other region within their, their own language. And other distinctive features, often at the level of the structure of the grammar or the pronunciation or the intonation that aren't because of any of these other factors above. So let me give you examples of each of these. So here is a uh, Hebrew and Judeo-Persian document of Bereshit, so the beginning of the Torah. And here you can see the Hebrew Bereshit, bara, et cetera, et cetera. And then here you see the Persian translation. It says Parsi, and then it has the Persian translation. Uh, and then here is an example of a Hebrew text of with alongside Judeo-Arabic. Here you have the Hebrew phrase Bereshit bara, and then an Aramaic translation, because Aramaic was um, part of the tradition of Judeo-Arabic speaking countries was to maintain the Aramaic translation. So big kadmin, bara, et cetera. And then here's the Arabic translation of that sentence. And then it goes on to the next sentence. And here's a Yiddish one. On this side, we have Bereshit bara, and on this side, in Onheb hot got bashafen dem himmel und die erd, uh, so which is a translation of that, that verse. And here, <clears throat> it's not just biblical text. We also have the Haggadah. This is the uh, what is what is recited on Passover. This one is a Jewish Neo-Aramaic one from the 20th century. And here on the right, you have Chacham Mahu Omer, that is from the four sons, the wise son. And here's the Aramaic translation, Chacham Ma Ava Gemer. And you can see there's a Hebrew loan word there, Chacham, right? Or um, it would be pronounced differently. Um, and but then, and you can see the similarity between the Hebrew and the Aramaic in uh, in its in the way that it's um, written, uh, Gemer instead of Omer. Uh, so similar but different words. So I mentioned this word for word translation tradition. Sometimes the translations are word for word. So we have, um, here's an example from Ladino that where you have Bereshit and then the Spanish would be, and the Spanish would be en el principio, but the Ladino is en principio. And then the Spanish would be Dios creo, but the Ladino is creo el dio because it's 
It's the same order as bara Elohim. And then here in, in Hebrew, we have et hashamayim, this little direct object marker. And the direct object marker doesn't exist in Spanish. There's not a separate word. So Ladino just uses the word a ah to imitate that word et. And uh, again here, a, la, a los cielos y a la tierra. And I'm going to share an image that Isaac made for the Jewish language project that shows how this plays out in other languages. And uh, we'll post this eventually uh, with the Jewish language project. You can see here how this plays out in uh, Yiddish, in Judeo-Persian, Ladino, Hula Ula, which is a variety of Jewish Neo-Aramaic, Yavanic, which is a Judeo-Greek, and Karaim, which is a Karaite Turkic language that Isaac wrote a beautiful description of on the Jewish language website. So sometimes this word for word translation tradition plays out in spoken language as well, not just in the actual translations of the text. So we have, for example, the phrase, the world to come, olam haba. The phrase in English, the world to come, doesn't really make much sense. What does that mean? Why don't you just say the coming world? And it's, it's, it's try, I think it's because it's imitating the word order of the original Hebrew. Uh, and same with, may her memory be for a blessing. That really sounds weird to most English speakers, but it sounds uh, normal to Jewish speak uh, to to a lot of Jews who are familiar with the Hebrew that it's based on zichrona livracha. Um, another example of that is e in Egyptian Judeo Arabic, where they also in their written text have a direct object mar marker on analogy with the Hebrew et. And that gets transferred, ila, gets transferred into everyday spoken Judeo-Arabic. And now we turn to Hebrew and Aramaic loanwords. So obviously, Hebrew and Aramaic loanwords are used for religious items and concepts. And I'll give you a few examples of those to show how they're similar, but also different in various Jewish languages. So here we have Egyptian Judeo-Arabic. Um, Shabbat or Sabt, and Judeo-Italian Shabbat, and Judaismo Shabbat, Yiddish Shabbos, and Jewish English Shabbos or Shabbat. But then, so those are all the same basic word, just pronounced a little differently. But then when we come to the name for evening prayers, we see that it's different words. So in Judeo-Arabic, it's Ma'ariv or Ma'arif, so similar to modern Hebrew and to Jewish English, Mariv. And, but then, and, and Yiddish is also that same word, but pronounced differently, Mariv. But then in Judeo-Italian, it is Ashkivenu, which is the name of one of the prayers that is recited in the evening service. And in Judaismo or Ladino, it is Arvit, which also has that same root of Ayin, Reish, Bet, Ma'ariv. Uh, but it is uh, a different a different uh, structure of that word. And Jew Arvid also exists in Jewish English, especially in Sephardic communities. And then we have uh, the word for Jewish holiday, which in Judeo-Arabic is mo'ed, and in Judeo-Italian is monged. So here you see how this ayin plays out differently in different languages, the a, uh, like down in the throat, of, of Arabic, um, but then in, in Italian, there isn't that sound, uh, so it is pronounced ng, and in fact, even it can even be used at the beginning of a word in Judeo-Italian, the way you say to see is ngainare, because it starts with an ayin, it's from the word ayin, which means I. And uh, then that same word in, Jude in, in Ladino is mued, and, but it's a different word in Yiddish, it's yontif, from Yom Tov, which is a word that is used in the blessings that are recited on Yom Tov. And in Jewish English, it is usually either Yontif or Chag, which is an influence from modern Hebrew. Here are some other examples of the uh, words for religious concepts in Jewish languages. And I'm sure I'm pronouncing these wrong. Please forgive me, but Il Masab Ta Afikumen which is the matzah of the afikomen that is used for the last thing that is eaten at the Passover Seder. 
Um, Jewish Malayalam Minyan Kuti means joined the quorum. And you, you can see the word minyan in there, minyan. Um, and, but it is used to mean had his bar mitzvah. In fact, the word bar mitzvah is mostly an Ashkenazi term. It's also found in Ladino and Judeo-Italian, but most Jewish languages don't use the word bar mitzvah. They, they have other words that are used instead, often the word tefillin, uh, because that is the first time that a boy would don tefillin, um, those black straps that are put on the arm and the head. And then we have Judeo-Italian has the word mezuzah. Uh, a mezuzah or mezuzah is a scroll that is placed on the doorpost of a house and rooms within the house that Jews live in. And But in Judeo-Italian, it also has a metaphorical meaning, which is beautiful woman. Why? Because from a male heterosexual perspective, a beautiful woman is someone you want to kiss and you kiss the mezuzah. So then we have a uh, secret language that is commonly used from Hebrew and Aramaic. Uh, and this makes sense because Jews were generally living as a minority in an, another land and they often had to keep secrets when, uh, especially in situations when Jews were heavily persecuted and so here's an example of that from Yiddish. Dabernisht, der Orl is maven kol dibber. So that means don't speak. The uncircumcised one understands every word. So, so this is a Germanic structure sentence. And the function words, the little words like der and is, the and is, um, are from German, right? But this would be uttered in the context of a Jew warning another Jew that a non-Jew understands German. Now they could because if they were normally speaking Yiddish, they would say "red nicht er versteht als was du sagst," and that uses mostly Germanic words, and so you can't say that because they would understand it. So instead, they use a Germanic sentence, but replacing those words with replacing the content words, the main words, with Hebrew words. And so this is an example of uh, using Hebrew words when you want to keep secrets. You also get this in the broader lexicon when you have words for non-Jewish concepts. So for example, in a number of languages, the word for non-Jewish holiday is Chaga or Choge. And the word for non-Jew is often arel, which means uncircumcised, or orl or ngarel in Judeo-Italian. There's that ayin again, um, or the, also the Yiddish word goy, which comes from the Hebrew word meaning nation, and that is often used in Jewish English and is is often considered offensive in Jewish English. And then uh, Jesus has a number of names in various Jewish languages, often secret words, but kind of euphemistic words, like Jews not wanting to say the name of Jesus and instead saying that one. So in Judeo-Italian, il udo, or in Ladino, otoa ish, that man, or that same phrase oisa ish in, uh, in, Ladin, in, in Yiddish, but then also tole, which is, it means literally hanging one. Now, sometimes this might be seen as kind of offensive, but it also makes sense that Jews being persecuted minorities would have distinctive ways of referring to non-Jewish religious figures so that if they did use those words, they wouldn't get in trouble. Another use of Hebrew and Aramaic loan words is euphemism. For example, in Judeo-Greek, we have the word ruchoth, which means heirs, but it also means farts. And we have the word rimonim, which means pomegranates, like it does in Hebrew, but it also means breasts. And we have the word tachach, which means under, but it also means rear end. And that word, that same word tachach is uh, the Yiddish word tuchis, which uh, has become part of Jewish English as well. Uh, Yiddish has some of my favorite euphemisms. 
So there's a blessing that is said after one goes to the bathroom that talks about all the holes in the body working properly. And the word for holes is nikavim or nikavim. And so one way to say in Yiddish to go to the bathroom is gain off nikavim. And but then you have to distinguish, are you gain? Uh, is it Nikovim Gedoilim or Nikovim Ketanim? Big holes or little holes, <laughs> right? Um, and then this one I think is my favorite. Asher Yotzer Papir is a euphemism for toilet paper because the name of that blessing is Asher Yatsar, um, basically saying uh, blessing God for creating us. Yatsar means to create, for creating us in a way that enables us to do all we need to do. There is also a tradition of using Hebrew and Aramaic loan words for other things that don't have real life reference and don't fall into any of these categories above. For example, in Judeo-German or Western Yiddish, bekitzer means briefly or in some, and tekef umiyad meaning immediately. Judeo-Arabic afilu meaning even so, and vadai meaning of course. Jewish English stam meaning only or just kidding. So now we're moving on to the next category of influence, which is influences from a previous Jewish language. Um, so in Ladino, we have the word alhad. Uh, a number of you mentioned that you speak Spanish, and so you probably know the word for Sunday in Spanish is domingo. And domingo also comes from Lord, because Sunday is the Lord's Day in Christian societies. Jews understandably didn't feel comfortable with this, so they maintained a word that was used by some of their ancestors who spoke Arabic. And so this is what I would call a heritage word. It's a word that, maintain, that is maintained within a community. That's a term from Evelyn Dean Olmsted's dissertation about Syrian Jewish communities in Mexico City, where she talks about how they maintain Judeo-Arabic, Syrian Judeo-Arabic words in their Spanish. Well, the same thing happened here. These Spanish speakers didn't want to say Domingo, so they maintained one of these heritage words that had been in their family uh, to refer to Sunday. We see the same in Judeo, um, in, in Yiddish, where um, the word bench means to bless, and that comes from Judeo-Italian benedice, why didn't they just use the German word for bless? Well, it is Zegenin, and that means to make the sign, as in make the sign of the cross. And understandably, Jews felt uncomfortable saying that for bless, in, for their blessings. So they maintained a word that was used by some of their ancestors when they lived in Italy before they moved to Germanic lands. Uh, an example from Judeo-French is cholent. So the word cholent, which refers to um, a Sabbath stew that is eaten in Jewish communities. Um, and why is it specific to Jewish communities? Because you're not supposed to cook on Shabbat. And so if you start the food cooking before Shabbat, it can, you can keep it warm uh, throughout the night and eat it for lunch the next day. And that is the case with shalom, which means to heat and or shallot, uh, which is from old French. Um, and so you see these words from languages that Jews spoke before they picked up a Germanic language that are maintained not only in Yiddish, but also until today in Jewish English. Moving on to archaisms, we have a number of um, features in various Jewish languages that Jews maintain even after their non-Jewish neighbors have moved on to other things, have changed the way they say things. And this, of course, is premised on the notion that language is always changing. Anytime um, we hear about people speaking differently, um, it might have to do with that language changing, that one group changed and the other did not. That's how the Romance languages came about. They started out as Latin and they changed enough that they became unintelligible to each other. So Spanish, Italian, French, Romance, etc. cetera. Um, and the case that, that is um, similar to what happened in Ladino, although is Ladino still mutually intelligible with Spanish? 
Probably. Well, we'll hear more about that next week when Brian Christian talks to us about Ladino. But um, some examples of archaic features in Ladino are word initial F that stems from Latin, like fazer versus hacer. Um, that F became an H and then disappeared in Spanish in general, like fondo versus hondo. And also, Ladino preserves the old Spanish phonemes sh and j, whereas Spanish changed them to ch. And um, this makes sense that, Sp that Ladino would have a lot of archaic features because it was maintained for centuries away from Spanish speakers. They were surrounded by speakers of Greek and Turkish and Bulgarian and Serbo-Croatian. And so it makes sense that their language would change, would, 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 would maintain some of these features when the Spanish language changed. But we also see archaic features in many Jewish languages that have non-Jewish neighbors around them who speak the local language that's similar to their own, right? Like Judeo-Georgian, for example, there's a term of endearment, Dagenatzvle, dag, dag I think. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. And non-Jews have a similar term, Genatzvale, so like a little bit different pronunciation. And so this is one of these things that if you are Jewish, you hear someone else say that and you say, oh, that they must be Jewish too. Another feature that distinguishes Jewish languages is what I mentioned before, migrated regionalisms. An example of this is in Judeo-Italian, features from Southern Italy that are found in the North. And this has to do with migration patterns and continuing contact among Jewish communities. Another example of that is in Jewish Neo-Aramaic, um, where we see that Jewish dialects are more similar to each other than to the Christian dialects that are spoken near them, which again shows continuing contact among Jewish communities in various parts of the Kurdish region. And finally, we have other distinctive features that are not in any of these other categories. So it makes sense that Ladino would have these uh, other distinctive features because it developed independently of Spanish to some extent. So an example of that is verde, meaning green, becomes vedre. It's, it's called metathesis, where two sounds switch their order. And um, an example of that from Baghdadi Judeo-Arabic is where the esh sound is pronounced as s. And this is very similar to the biblical shibboleth, right? That in the, there's a biblical story about warring factions. And when someone said S or Esh, they could tell which faction they were from. So if someone says, how do you say the word Sheboleth? And if it's Esh, then they kill them. If it's S, they don't. Uh, this didn't happen to the same uh, dire extent in um, Baghdad, but uh, it was a Shibboleth that if a Jew pronounced that sound as an S, then people could tell that they were likely Jewish. So I would argue that, that all of these features are found in contemporary Jewish English, except for the Hebrew writing system. Most Jews do not write English in Hebrew letters, like saying, hello, my name is, you know, in Hebrew letters, right? There are some exceptions to this, and I gave a talk about this at one point uh, with the, uh, with Jewish Live, which was related to Judaism Unfound, right, um, about the Hebrew use of Hebrew letters in English political uh, buttons and bumper stickers and university t-shirts and names of sports teams and a few other exceptions like that. I, I published an article about that. If you're interested, I can share that with you later. Uh, so, but aside from those minor exceptions, most Jewish English writing is in English letters. And that is also the case for Jewish Latin American Spanish, Brazilian Portuguese, Jewish Swedish, Jewish uh, French. Most of these contemporary Jewish language varieties are not written in Hebrew letters. And in fact, um, we can 
Well, well, first, let, let's think about where we would place Jewish English on this continuum. Orthodox Jewish English can be so different that you really need subtitles. And it's really hard to understand if you aren't familiar with Orthodox Jewish English. And I would say that secular Jewish English is even less distinct. You know, plenty of Jews speak English in a way that no one would ever know that they're Jewish and they would never even use any distinctive features, except maybe saying a word like bris and yortzeit here and there. The, uh, the question of language versus dialect is a, a long-standing question, and we don't have time today to talk about it in detail, but just the basics. The distinction between a language and a dialect is really a sociological and political distinction. It's not a linguistic one. There is a linguistic concept of mutual intelligibility or not, and you can say, well, if the two language varieties are not mutually intelligible, then they are considered separate languages. If they are mutually intelligible, then they're dialects of the same language. However, this is complicated because sometimes mutual intelligibility can be one-sided, whereas some people who speak Portuguese say that they can understand Spanish, but that people who speak Spanish say they can't understand Portuguese. You can't always use mutual intelligibility as a way of distinguishing. In fact, the way that people talk about languages being languages or dialects is really connected to political autonomy and religion and writing system. Just to give you a few examples, um, Chinese is often talked about as a language, but really it's multiple mutually unintelligible languages that share a writing system. Uh, Mandarin, Cantonese, etc., have the, you can't understand each other when you're speaking, but they share the writing system. And so they're often talked about as the Chinese language. Um, another example that relates to writing system is um, Hindi and Urdu. Hindi and Urdu are pretty similar, mostly mutually intelligible, but they're written in different alphabets. Hindi is written in the Devanagari script and Urdu is written in the Arabic script. And um, they're also differentiated by country, um, whereas Hindi is spoken in India, Urdu is spoken in Pakistan. And so the idea of writing system and political autonomy and religion, Hindu versus Islam, it, it are so bound up with considering these to be different languages, even if they're mutually intelligible. Another example of political autonomy is um, Serbo-Croatian. Um, the former Yugoslavian countries um, once saw themselves as speaking a language, um, Serbo-Croatian, but now sees themselves as speaking multiple languages, Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian, et cetera, um, relating to the independence of these nations. Um, we see the same with Swedish and Danish and Norwegian, the Scandinavian languages, they're pretty similar, but they're seen as different languages because they're different languages of different country. Now, of course, the country thing doesn't always work because there are 200 something countries and 7,000 something languages, right? So it's not like each country has a language. And in fact, the idea of a country having its own special language is a remnant of 19th century nationalism. The idea that a country should have a special language that unifies the country is, is something that um, nationalizers were hoping to accomplish. And you see this in Italy, for example, whereas people in the north of Italy and the south of Italy, especially Sicily, barely understand each other, but they all now are supposed to learn Italian in schools because that was an effort at um, bringing the country, unifying the country um, in, uh, in a, I believe in the 19th century. And, um, and, that, and we'll see this next week when we talk about language endangerment, how um, a country's language policies, especially around education, can often lead to the endangerment of longstanding languages or language varieties. Well, we are just about out of time. So I just wanna make sure to, since Tubishvat is coming, I will just share this one little image with you. Um, here we go. Uh, this is Tubishvat in multiple Jewish languages. 
and you can see how the different Jewish languages have different ways of referring to this holiday. Some use the word Tu Bishvat pronounced differently, Tu Bishvat or Tu Bishvat, um, and but some have totally different words. Like in Yiddish, the word is Chamishosa, which means 15, because Tu is the 15th day of the month of Shvat, Tu Bishvat, the 15th of the month of Shvat. Um, and then others refer to trees, like the night of the trees and the holiday of the trees, the gift of the trees, or fruit, las frutas, the fruits, fruit eating, blossoming of the dry tree. And in Judeo-Georgian, it is the phrase seven species. Why? Because in um, Tu Bishvat, one of the things we celebrate is the seven species of fruit that are uh, not just fruit, but also grains that are um, associated with the land of Israel in, in uh, the Tanakh, in, in, in the Bible. So, okay, well, we are out of time. I will save the chat so that I can read them all later, and I will make sure to address any questions that, that arrived there. Um, save chat, hold on, how do I save the chat? Um, there it is. Um, okay, and I'll stick around here in case anyone has any individual questions. And if not, I will see you all next week. Happy to be shot.